Take it away, Alice. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on this uh, fourth digital transformation uh, webinar series put on by the IADD. Um, our, our focus and our mission and vision here is to talk about people and culture and how we support that uh, with great software technology. So what we will what we will do be doing uh, throughout this we do we host these every about eight weeks every other month and again the idea is to help raise the bar and educate and just raise the dialogue about really where the rubber meets the road in terms of digital transformation uh, we we all kind of understand these concepts in our mind we have an idea of what they are but there are you know, real people, real companies out there doing really hard work um, to, um, to recognize the benefits of leveraging software and technology and good infrastructure um, in their businesses and in their operations. Uh, so that, that is the goal and the mission uh, for our, uh, our IADD Digital Transformation Webinar Series. Most of these will focus uh, more in the drilling space, of course, but then we'll all, all, we always bring in, um, we try to mix in uh, perspectives from other industries and things of that nature. So to all of our attendees, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today, we'll talk about the digital transformation in the world of drill bits. Chaitanya Vampati with Baker Hughes will speak for 20 to 30 minutes, uh, just about some of the uh, the things that he is seeing, the efforts that they, they are making um, at Baker Hughes, but really as an industry, um, his, his uh, viewpoint on, on the matter. And um, then we'll take about a five minute break. And uh, then Andrew Poon with Schlumberger and Nathan Zanero with Teradata will join Chaitanya on a panel. Um, that will be about 1045-ish. We would love to make this uh, an open dialogue and a discussion with our attendees. Um, we've got um, kind of a small niche. This is almost a little bit more of a round table discussion. So I would encourage any of you to please um, post questions in the chat. Uh, we'll be watching out for those. Um, feel free to raise your hand um, and, and uh, you know, just engage in more of a dialogue and a conversation. So with that, uh, Chaitanya, I will turn it over to you. I will stop sharing my screen and you can take over. Thank you, Alison. Uh, give me one second. Yeah. Um, let me start sharing my screen here. Cool, I'm hoping everybody can see the screen. You're good to go. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, anybody uh, who have signed up. I have taken your time to, to attend this uh, you know, webinar series. Um, my name is Chaitanya Vampati, and I'm gonna talk about digital transformation about, of uh, drill bits, right? I mean, it's a very, very favorite topic of mine. I mean, this is the life I live. Um, to, to begin with, uh, I want to tell, a little bit of, about myself, uh, you know, you might say it's uh, shameless advertising, but it is what it is, right? Um, so currently I'm the product line digital lead for drill bits. Um, I lead the digital development group that, um, you know, develops in-bit measurement platform, you know, looking at in-bit measurement uh, and all of the digital tools that transform the business, whether it's internal or external through data-driven approaches. I mean, to be to be honest, I've always been passionate about uh, you know utilizing data-driven approaches and developing innovative products within uh, within the space, right? So um, you know, I, ever since I've I've got my master's degree um, in, from the University of Texas, um, I, I've always thought about you know every problem has um, ha has a slightly different solution than you know what's conventionally thought through, right? So you you have to think through on what what are the different ways of solving the problem, you know, and, and always drive your solution through data driven approaches, right? That's always been my belief, um, and 
before you know sort of i begin you know i wanted to sort of uh, take a moment and and sort of say that you know we have a lot of problems uh, our industry is struggling and big data will come and rescue us all right <laughs> and uh, um you know i can you know i really wanted to talk about how big data is going to enhance our productivity um as someone who has practiced quote unquote uh, data science for over 15 years now and it, it sort of always baffles me on how uh, how entertaining it is that people get stuck on these buzzwords right rather than workflows um, I don't know if you all uh, follow Simon Sinek or if you have watched his uh, TED talk um, I mean I would strongly encourage you all to watch it because I mean I subscribe to his thinking right I mean we, we really need to ask ourselves why and and it's a very simple concept you know why are we doing certain things it's a very enlightening to see how such a simple concept can reveal uh, such deep insights about you know how you do things and about your organizational culture right um, and I also wanted to mention here is that I am not an IT guy. So, you know, for people uh, who find me on LinkedIn and you want to ping me about enterprise architecture and enterprise software, I'm not the right guy. I am a, I'm a, I'm a fully drill bits guy. Uh, I mean, I've always been a drill bits guy from design uh, and sort of uh, analysis background. So, um, Coming back to the actual question that I posed a, a, a few seconds before, right? Why do we need digital, digitization in drill bits? And, and the, the real answer is that even though drill bits is a, is a tool that cuts rock, um, it's been associated historically with huge changes in, uh, in performance, right? I still remember the days in East Texas where we used to drill, you know, 10, 15 bits mix of roller cone and PDCs, struggle to drill 10, I mean, 100 feet. And, you know, 150 foot run was, was, a, was considered a really good run. And, and, and in my lifetime, now it's been almost a section to uh, a section run, right? Um, it's, it's huge and transformational. And, you know, a lot of those, changes have happened through drill bit technologies, right? And all of those changes are possible only through sort of relentless focus on planning, um, design, you know, solution generation, you know, execution, and sort of closing the loop on post-run analysis uh, and communication, right? To get a bit on the ground, right? Everything starts with with planning. I mean, we do, uh, we typically, uh, I mean, as drill bits personnel, we typically pull to do drillability analysis, rock mechanical property estimation, think about uh, the stringers or chert that might encounter. You know, we typically also do hydraulic analysis. We do some offset analysis to see which bits were drilled on the offsets. Um, and, you know, we tie it all together with, with sort of bit selection. Um, you know, how do you design a new bit? You know, think about all of how we can actually simulate the drilling, you know, cutting modeling. Uh, we, we are proposing solutions all the time. Um, and it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't end there, right? The, you know, we propose a solution, customer buys it. It's just the beginning of the execution cycle, which you know you have to support them. You know, um, at 1 a.m. in the night when you know the bit quits drilling and you want an until date, you just have to do a quick analysis to figure out which one uh, is available from an inventory perspective, which one's the most suitable. Uh, we also do a lot of field capture of data historically. That's why drill bits uh, within the Baker Hughes organization has been in charge of brick count. Um, huge, you know, field data capture, um, you know, workflows associated. Um, we we got to think about the, you know, the dull capture and, and, and the post run scenarios where the customers are expecting us to under, you know, tell us whether, you know, whatever changes we've made have worked, whatever we've done to the bit, um, you know, have shown promise and what's going to be the next step. And then, you know, if you all have seen me on, on LinkedIn, or if you all have seen this invite on LinkedIn and, and seen the you know, bit summary in information, it sort of uh, also uh, 
says the importance of the social media presence on how we, it is important to communicate the, the lessons learned. Hey, we've got a new bit in this area, right? And, and the social media thing has, has taken on a world of itself uh, lately. Um, so all of these workflows are, are very, very important and, and have become part and parcel of basically drill bits. And these workflows aren't just there to, uh, because of you know, doing business, but they are actually aligned to the operator expectations of you know, longer life, the operator expectations of performance optimization, tool life elimination, I mean, tool life extension, you know, eliminating failures. Um, and really all operators want us to do a data-driven decision-making. And, and this is the core of uh, the ask because people, I mean, gone are the days where, you know, an experienced guy would walk up to the rig and look at the dolls, you know, you know turn on the cones and say, Oh yeah, I think you need this bit next, right? And we would trust him. And and people aren't buying that anymore because enough, more than enough times that even people with tremendous experience have made mistakes. And you know that's just you know the cost of a mistake is is gone way too high these days, right? And internally, that puts an enormous amount. These expectations from the operators puts an enormous amount of pressure for service providers. Um, you know, think about all the drilling optimization and design changes that are required. Think about you know the the tremendous amount of product and inventory people have to maintain. Think about all of the changes, especially you know in drill bit world, cutter cutter tracking, cutter performance is a huge area of interest. I mean, typically we do from hundreds to thousands of tests. Um, a, a year and trying to understand and, and statistically evaluate whether uh, you know something's made a difference is a fairly challenging task, right? And the biggest challenge is to do all of these cycles in, in a time efficient way. You know, the biggest challenge is to do it in a cost effective way. So how do you shrink all of the pieces of data that you that you uh, measure in each of these processes, combine all of them, and you know form a unified story and a form a unified expectation, um, and, and deliver that time and time again, right? So that is the key challenge. And I am for for the sake of this talk, I mean, I can choose any one of these topics and go at length. Um, however. Uh, what I've decided to chose um, and, and what I decided to focus on because probably of the interest um, and you know what makes for a good conversation topic today is is how do drill bits sort of are approaching this application analysis space right and when I talk about application analysis um, it, it sort of application engineering it, it encompasses all of these, but it's mostly around the solution gener generation, right? Um, so the key, pro I mean, the key aspects of the application analysis, as you see on the on the slides, are are basically first is to identify the problem, like like anything else, and typically that involves quite a bit of data analysis. Uh, at Baker Hughes, um, you know, we've we've decided to sort of spend quite a bit of, uh, you know, of our effort in trying to um, do a lot more in terms of the application analysis. How do you crunch the data? How do you get to, you know, single well and multi well sort of analysis at our fingertips really to understand how much power um, and ROP is delivered. Um, I mean, power is delivered to the bit and the ROP that is being generated I mean, to really look at granularity uh, and identify opportunities for improvement. And, and also there is this world of, you know, I mean, identifying problems in area of drill bits are almost often, uh, I mean, almost always is uh, involved with um, some sort of a dull grade uh, or identifying how much, you know, the damage the bit has taken. There is a lot of conversation in the in the industry these days about the uh, machine learning and metrology and i'm going to talk a little bit about that aspect as uh, as well and, and the the next big thing that's going on in the industry um you, you know sort of is how do you do sort of uh, in the in-bit measurements right and um, it, this has taken on a, uh, a life of its own recently partly because of identification of some key um 
key dysfunctions that are only measurable near the drill bits um, and, and really to enhance uh, um, your power delivery or to really understand what's going on with your failures, tool failures, um, and, and to reduce them. A lot of people, a lot of uh, operators, and including drill uh, drill bits at Baker Hughes, has has focused on you know really being able to measure properly what's happening down hole, um, and and give an understanding of the problem that's not that hasn't been possible before. Right? Um, it, it's one thing to understand the problem. It's one thing to to think about. Hey, I mean, I've done some analysis. I figured out you have ROP issues here. I've I've done some you know in bit vibration analysis. But how do you actually generate a solution? Right? There is uh, you know historically uh, we we invested quite heavily. I mean, the 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 industry as such invested quite heavily in this three D cutting modeling tools. Um, and what I've observed is the last five years, people. I mean. Things have started to taper off, and people, you know, didn't really do a lot of. I mean, you 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 go to any SP conferences, the, you know, previously there used to be like five, ten papers on modeling and simulation. Nowadays, we two we see one or two coming up. Um, I think, in per, uh, personally, there is an increased need to enhance this further. Uh, We've recently started, we recognize this and we've certainly recently overhauled our entire 3D cutting modeling uh, and simulation process, really thinking about how you engage in the various forms of drilling, whether it's um, whether it's vertical curve tangents and the engagement areas, we've found tremendous use of uh, the advanced, um, you know, completely overhauled process of modeling into really tailor design uh, design attributes, especially things like you know depth of cut control elements, engagement elements, gauge pad design, etc., and tie that to the to the application specificity uh, of the the solutions. I mean, we've we've had um, the rich areas of you know solution toolbox whether it be you know there is a there's a lot of push for shaped cutting elements these days there is a lot of push for different pdc design elements um there's obviously you know chimera or and, and hybrid uh, bits that are being offered from uh, from baker hughes um there is also i think an area that's that is just beginning to be explored but there is a lot of potential which is around adaptive uh, drill bits and how you know things could change down hole and also predictively modeling uh, some of what's going to happen while drilling, right? And these two areas, uh, there's a lot of talk about it. There is, you know, few sort of solutions that have been out there. I mean, even as Baker Hughes, we had, you know, an adaptive drill bit solution. But I think personally, we have a lot more to do in this area as an industry. And I think we 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 can do a lot more in this area. And I think that's probably one of the things that we should look forward to in the future as well as the data-driven approaches, um, you know, tied to the solution generation, I think adaptivity plays a very key role, right? And I'm going to talk uh, a bit about all of these four in a little bit more detail. Uh, first, thinking about uh, the problems of, uh, you know, so the drilling data analysis. I mean, I think of a sort of the drilling data analysis is as an ecosystem because when it pertains to drill bits, it's not always just real time because you have certain information that is happening before the drilling, which is around the you know sort of BHA design, well design, bit design, etc. And we have certain information that's only available after drilling, like bit dull, you know, the essential result of what's happening, where it broke down, how it broke down, etc. So. It is sort of an ecosystem that needs to gather all of these data, whether it's from the surface, whether it's from well-designed formation, downhole, uh, in-bit measurements, and, and really think in a, in a big way about how do you automatically tie in all of the data sets. Um, keep in mind that many of times, you know, drill bits and drilling services uh, are not provided by the same company, so you, you have you know, multiple data sets with different types coming. Uh, you, you have to figure out how to clean them. You have to figure out how to match them, et cetera. And, and really about providing these analytics, visualization and insights, uh, you know, part automatically, part through SMEs, because to really close the loop on at least drill bit design, you have to get 
you know, the design engineers involved to think about the bit design, think about the BHA design and the operational changes that it might encounter. So to kind of put this in perspective, it is a fairly challenging problem. And, and that's kind of why I, I mean, I put a cloud in the middle um, to give, give everybody a hint of whether, you know, a scalable architecture could be cloud-based, but doesn't have to be. Uh, but certainly what we found is, you know, the cloud-based um, analytics capabilities have provided quite a bit of, uh, um, uh, you know, opportunity for, for us to really, you know, challenge our thinking in this uh, realm and, and make significant progress. Uh, and we've begun to see some of the results of some of the progress here. And then and, and there's a lot more to be, to be had here too, right? And, and talking about some of the challenges that I was mentioning and, and you know, for people in the audience who may not appreciate this or, or um, the, um, the consistency of the data, which we keep talking about uh, for the last five, six, seven years, it's still not 100%. I mean, think about the various places in the world that we, we operate in from, you know, say Norway to uh, Gulf of Thailand to back. I mean, it's not always the same and, and it makes things very difficult to, to build, right? And very difficult. We still have a lot of issues with aliasing and we still have a lot of issues with, with just all, you know, all kinds of different ways of measuring, all kinds of different units and, and things like that. Um, so th there is there is quite a bit of data consistency that that can be brought together um, in this area. I mean, as an industry, you know, we've made progress and, and standardized certain things. I think we can certainly make the next step and standardize much further, and, and much better. Uh, and and I, I see um, some encouraging signs, especially you know, uh, for those of you not aware, IADC. Uh, is going through the dull grading standardization and an upgrade uh, led by Paul Pustusik and. Um, uh, and from the IDC side, and and a lot of people, it's a it's a you know an industry consortium, um, and we are participating in that as well. Um, the other challenge that I notice is that there's a lot of uh, causal uh, inf inference work. I mean, still going on without all the pieces of information. So we get a dull grade, and we make we already make a prediction on what might have happened, and we're already acting on it. Whereas to really make a, a, a proper failure analysis, you, you have to sometimes get all the pieces of information, whether it be MWD, whether it be the rig data and everything, right? I, I certainly, I mean, I think the challenge there is that people find that you know the time to solution when you get all the data gets dragged on and they wanna make very quick decisions. And, and, and certainly that's, as much as all of these are challenges, there are also opportunities. The more time you, the, the, that you can shrink from the time where the data is generated to the solution, I think a lot of this will sort of vanish, right? Um, we continue to make a lot of decisions on one, two runs, like one, you know, how, how many times you, you sort of got, get on LinkedIn and you, you find yourself uh, looking at a record run, right? And there's only so many record runs. I mean, and, and every decision can't be made on, on record runs, right? So I think, um, you know, the statistical sort of A-B testing type uh, analysis um, is limited partly because just the velocity of changes, you know, is way too much for us. I mean, not just from drill bits, but also from drilling. And, and it's something that we, again, as we shrink the time to analyze, as we shrink the time to, to understand, this will get better, I think. And lastly, one one sort of uh, one thing that I wanted to, to to have people take away is that drilling is a process, right? And every process has measures and controls, and we need to be putting ourselves in the best data position to have those controls and to have those measurements and to make sure that we are going down the right track, right? And 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 to wrap up on on some of the performance data analysis, really, I think where where it's going to be really key for rapid development and, and where it's going to be key for minimizing, um, you know, guesswork is around, you know, sort of this time-based offset analysis area where we really need to understand, you know, get towards whether it's um, A-B testing, some of the statistical analysis, um, variable importance type measurements, you know, whether it's BIT or BHA or, you know, what's going on. And, and also further to understand that there is sort of this kitchen sink approach that's sometimes taken where we, 
where we sit down in a room and we said, okay, how can we solve this problem? And we throw the kitchen sink. There are 15 different variables that go into a, a particular solution. Yes, it works, but people just don't know what worked, right? And, um, and in terms of the scalability, we really need to challenge and the operators are challenging it and ourselves from, from showing like, hey, here's one run versus the other and, and this is good to going towards, hey, here's 10, 20 runs versus here's 10, 20, 30 runs in terms of the, on the time-based analysis. And, and that's certainly an opportunity. Uh, and we're, we've made a lot of progress in that area. And I think it's enlightening when you look at it uh, in that perspective and put it at, at that scale, right? Um, we still, I think, don't do a very good job of uh, risk reduction. Um, and, and when I say that, it, it seems like, you know, we, we make decisions on BIT and BHAs independently and, and there is no criticism here. I mean, it is uh, what's, I mean, it's, it's the nature of the business. I mean, we, we select the motor separately sort of from the BIT um, or we select the, uh, an RSS system completely differently to the BIT and so on. So there is, there is, a, there is a need for closer tie I see a lot of progress in that area, actually, um, in, in the last few years. I think there is a lot of more progress to be had in really understanding uh, risk reduction from bit BHA matching, but also from bit formation uh, matching and understanding formation faults, et cetera, and trying to really key in on what, what design variables that we need to play with. Um, and, and, the, and lastly, I think there is a huge opportunity for enhancing our drilling roadmaps. Um, there's, there's a lot of progress made. There's a lot of software tools available that claim to, that actually do drilling roadmaps. But what the key pieces of information I think they're missing is that um, really need to tie, I mean, a lot of design parameters that are suggested, like whether it's weight, RPM, et cetera, have a really profound influence on how the bit responds and how the bit really um, operates. So, Every bit vendor knows that there are certain depth of control, uh, control elements or how we design certain features that only engage and disengage based on uh, certain ROP profiles. There is a lot of tie to be had uh, and the same sort of expectation probably exists from the motor world and the RSS world because they design their motors to be a certain operating envelope. They design the RSS to be a certain operating envelope to have an enhanced roadmap that takes into account some of these constraints, some of these uh, ties that to bit and tool type is gonna be a very key aspect moving forward. Um, and I think that's gonna be a key area of interest at least for us. Um, um, and, and also to tie it all up, predictive modeling, at least you know, failure prediction, where prediction is, is also something that's, that's uh, a very exciting area of interest too. Um, I, I promise you all that you know I will I will go into a little bit more detail about drill bit drill bit metrology. Uh, there has been a heavy area of interest on drill bit metrology these days. A lot of operators are going in and, and wanting to know you know cutter cutter level uh, information. Um, and, and I I mean there are more approaches than this, uh, but I tend to put all of the drill bit metrology into these three buckets, and and I'm going to explain to you guys why. One is along the field-based, you know, sort of photometrology. And, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, as you see on the screen, you, you go there, you take, you pull up your phone, you take your pictures and, and the computer uh, generated computer vision algorithm here automatically detects the cutters and detects where it's broken, gives it a, you know, per cutter dull grade, or it, it can even go even further and, and evaluate volume, I mean, volume of diamond loss, et cetera. And there are several advantages of this, right? And it works with good low resolution pictures. It greatly enhances our per cutter dull capabilities. Um, uh, however, right? I mean, it, what it misses is that um, there's a lot of times when, you know, the dull isn't what it appears, right? I mean, you, you might look at it and it's obvious the cutter is broken. Uh, but it may not be as obvious when the cutter is actually cracked and almost about to sort of fall over, right? 
and you know there's several of those um, and cutter vendors online whoever might be listening might might appreciate the fact that you know cracking is nearly as important or micro cracks or how it has actually started to fail is is equally important to uh, what's been the end results so, so this is a good way of capturing the end results but there is you know there are other approaches i mean for example i mean detail inspection sort of uh, you know die penetrant type tests you know pick up a lot of those you know at, at baker hughes we basically collect amo information on every one of those cutters um and, and so do many other uh, vendors as well and, and that looks for you know chipping micro cracking etc i mean that gives like the nth detail because you're looking at it um we're in a completely different situation and it is really designed for inspection, right? Um, there's also the the third uh, aspect, which is sort of the full scale laser type, you know, metrology. Whether it could be laser or also photometrology, um, which is which kind of bucket into the same setup here. Um, you know, my, our experience has been the laser uh, metrology produces far higher accurate results than the photometrology. Um, but essentially the challenge is that you have to put it in, in, in sort of a location where an area where where you can scan quote unquote scan the entire bed and look at the volume losses and etc we've we've got tremendous actually uh use cases out of our our laser metrology system to really understand you know how much engagement area there is you know gauge pad design um, and to really highlight the importance of laser metrology, you know, I don't think our some of our enhancements in in our in our hybrid bits or some of our enhancements in our adaptive bits would not have been possible if we don't we weren't looking at the engagement in a, in, in such high accuracies, right? So now, you know, a lot of people want to ask the question like, which is better? I don't think we we have to choose one versus the other. I think we, uh, as we are doing. I think all three have their own advantages. All three have their own, um, you know, limitations, and that is what I think we need to. Um, th that is what I think we need to go forward with, right? I mean, and and really the key here is that um, how do you actually tie all of these data sets to come up with one solution and tie it with the with, with the data that is being captured at the bit, right? And uh, talking of which, I mean, talking of trying to understand what's happening. Uh, a lot of progress uh, has been made in, in the in-bit vibration measurement. I mean, some of the vibration measurement uh, systems out there, at least, I mean, our latest version of the vibration measurement system actually exceeds some of the MWD or, or um, you know, some of the real-time tool capabilities out there in terms of the frequency capture and, you know, uh, some of the capabilities that it's able to offer. However, we still find that uh, there, there is a lot of people out there who don't believe that they need to run or understand it, right? Whether it be thinking like, hey, you know, I don't have a vibration problem <laughs> or, or uh, uh, hey, if it's not real time, it's not useful, right? But I, I certainly think as I put together in, in early on in my presentation that this isn't, um, you know, designing and improving drilling is, is part real time, part looking at the tools and, and designing new structures, which is not quite real time. There is a huge, and, and we, the more data that we collect and the more information we have at hand to come up with the right solution, the better off we'll be, right? Um, and, and, and you know, I've put a couple of uh, use cases, at least in the drill bit world, like, you know, here's, here's our, you know, in-bit sensing module where you've got various, uh, uh, you know, parameters being run, and you can really certainly uh, think about how depth of cut control element can be targeted to control the stick slip that that you might be seeing here. Um, you know, here, you know, in a case where you have lateral vibrations that are being measured, you you have to think about you know how and what strategies, whether it be bit design parameter strategies uh, that can be used to to alleviate these and enhance bit life. Uh, so, and, and you know, think about um, you know this case where you know the RPM is falling and and the um, the motor is sort of failing. 
how do you keep the motor life longer? You know, how can bit motor be collaborative in a way that you know you can extend the life to to enhance the performance even more, right? So, I, I can keep going on and on about uh, some of these cases and see how valuable it is. I still think it's it's hugely valuable to to run it. We are certainly at a stage where we 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 can scalably run all of these um, sort of electronics packages in in bit on many, if not all of, of the runs. And, and I think that's certainly uh, something that we should think about as, as we go towards the future, right? Um, the key is not only to understand the problem, uh, which is what I've sort of focused on till now, but also once we understood the problem, how do you really simulate that? And how do you arrive at, uh, at a data-driven approaches for, for, um, for designing the right bit and the right configuration, right? Um, a lot of customers are, take, you know, almost personal interest in drill bit design and, um, you know, people in the drill bit world will, will find it very entertaining that, you know, it's, it's a very, very uh, personal thing for people to design bits, right? I mean, we, it's routine to have very long drawn out kind of discussions with the customer on you know how to place a certain element, where are we engaging and so on. So it, you know, it, to, to really cut down on that cycle, to really answer some of the questions that the customers pose to, to be responsive, I think you know, the cutting simulation, especially you know, that's getting out of some of the old school approaches to some of the newer approaches that are out there is key. Um, here's you have a couple of images showing how certain engagement um, um, at a certain depth of cut uh, is seen on a certain drill bit. And the key is that all of the data that we've collected before, if you are able to tie it to the, um, whether it be metrology or whether it be uh, foot on time-based analysis, if you are able to tie it with the simulator, you set yourself up to generate um, designs much, much, much faster, right? And there's some challenges in, in data manipulation there uh, and so on. So I think I've got like last five, four, five minutes and I'm gonna end my um, conversation here by talking about, I think, um, some of the future technologies that I think would be very key for, for, for our industry. I mean, I think, uh, one of the things that is starting to emerge, and we, we're seeing, you know, certainly papers in the SPE being uh, written and talked about, is you know how do you combine physics and data-driven approaches to to really push the boundaries on predictability? I mean, one good case study that's been published recently is around bitware prediction and how. Um, and you're more than welcome to go out there to the SPE world and read out there to see how you know, bitware you know, can be predicted and what it means for you know, real-time um, sort of prediction of dull, dull grid and real-time prediction and, and modification of, ROP, of operating parameters to maximize ROP. Uh, HFTOs or high frequency torsional oscillations is a, is a huge area of interest, particularly because of its effect on how um, uh, it leads to some of the tool failures. And there's a key area of interest on how bit features affect HFTOs and how we can certainly dampen some of these HFTOs to, to uh, enhance bit life. Uh, a big area of interest, um, very much a data-driven approach uh, in that. Um, I've talked about in-bit measurements. I mean, we need to really get to sort of a scale in the in-bit measurements, not, not think of it like a project one versus project two, and, and, but keep on uh, doing it in a much more scalable way. I, I mentioned before that we're just scratching the surface on adaptive technologies and there's a lot more to be gained there. Uh, I, I certainly think um, you, you know, that area is, is sort of underexplored. Um, and, and I think there is a world where you know, the data is going to be democratized enough uh, and really that's gonna happen when you monetize this modeling analytics and and simulation, as long as it's for free, it's not gonna be a lot of democratization going on. So as the customers sort of, uh, and this is probably my appeal to them, is that as you think about, you know, sort of monetization, it doesn't have to be a lot, even there is a little bit of monetization in that is a tremendous uh, uh, sort of impetus for moving the industry forward. Um, and there is also how drill bits play in, in the automation, how drill bits tie to the drilling optimization uh, and automation sphere as well. 
Uh, and, you know, to finish off, I'd like to leave with a couple of food for thoughts. Um, you know, think about, you know, the collaboration potential that is, uh, that is, that is possible when uh, all, you know, bit vendors and, um, you know, MWD vendors, direction drillers all can collaborate. Think about the, you know, instead of having a constant uh, motor versus drill bit sort of specs war, uh, collaboratively, you know, what can we do in that area? You know, BIT and RSS is the same way. What can we do in the area? What can we do to sort of achieve, you know, predictable high, R in high build up rate and high ROP with one burn, you know, curve lateral where instead of us trying to design like, hey, you know, slightly slower curve bit and faster lateral bit or slightly slower lateral bit and, you know, faster curve bits and things like that. Um, think about, you know, uh, a world where we could just do massive analysis, 100, you know, 200 wells, and and you know, sort of glean the um, input from from the insights that are generated. And, and lastly, I, I mean, I think um, I, I don't know how my audience is going to receive this, but there is certainly um, a, a conversation that's happening in our in our industry about you know carbon reduction. Every operator has committed themselves to carbon reduction. And how that actually affects drill bits? How much will they be adopted? Um, you know, will that actually you know make physical changes to anything that's going to be happening in our strategies? Will steel body bits increase in popularity because of that? And you know, there's a lot of questions there, right? So, um, so that with that, I I think that would be my 30, 40 minutes. Um, and you know, I'd like to pause for questions and. Um, Take it from there. Thank you, Chaitanya. Um, so what, what I think we'll do um, is uh, we've got some, already some discussion and some dialogue going on in the, uh, in the chat. Um, and then obviously we wanna bring in our panelists, Andrew Poor uh, with Slumberger and Nathan Zanero will be uh, joining us. Um, let's take about a five minute bio break. Uh, I've got 1043 on, on my uh, time. So uh, here in just about five minutes, let's uh, jump back on and I'll have uh, Andrew Poor. Uh, again, I wanna correct that. I, I, I misspoke earlier, so I'm correcting it now. Uh, and then Nathan Zanero join Chaitanya um, as panelists. And then I think uh, any questions that the attendees have um, or we can also get started with just reading out some of these uh, comments uh, in the chat. Uh, those should be enough to spur some discussion as well. So with that, we'll see you in, in just about five minutes. All right. All right, welcome back everyone. Hope everyone is nicely caffeinated. Um, I've left a, a few of the events up here. Uh, check out um, IADD International's website. We've got this um, shrimp boil coming up, so hope you guys can join us. Uh, all right, with that, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing. And, okay. So with that, uh, Chaitanya, thank you very much for, for speaking. Uh, Andrew Poor with Slumberger and Nathan Zanero are going to join Chaitanya right now. And uh, we will just open it up. Um, there are some dialogues going on in the chat. Uh, I'll read these out just in case um, people aren't seeing them. Um, Oscar Sanchez made a comment with different technologies being different among bit service companies. How can this process be scalable to evaluate competitors' products, um, especially since not always a benchmark product is, is a baker bit? So I think that would be a good one to start off on. Um, however, first, uh, Andrew and Nathan, would you guys go ahead and uh, just do a little introduction for yourselves? And then uh, let's dive on in. Sure, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start here. So uh, Andrew Poor, I've uh, got about 13 years in uh, the industry with Smith Bits. Uh, I've kind of traveled all around the world with them in uh, different various areas and uh, really excited to be here. I think the digital transformation of the oil field is something that's 
obviously ubiquitous in, in the industry and in many other industries. So uh, it's really exciting. It's kind of the cutting edge of, of technologies. And uh, as Chaitanya said, uh, I mean, highlighted many, many times, it's, a, it's a really an exciting topic. So uh, very excited to be here and, and happy to, of course, answer any questions, uh, Nathan. Yeah, so this is Nathan Zanero here. Um, my experience is in uh, rig controls and, and systems, also drilling engineering for a long time, but really fundamentally all aspects of petroleum engineering from reservoir simulation, front end engineering and design. And um, today I work for Teradata where I'm working on data science and analytics and really just helping to uh, kind of do what, what the question asked here is, how to scale solutions that are independent of products and services. Awesome, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, um, let's kick it off with just a comment about, um, I know Paul, Paul responded, but uh, with uh, kind of the open source efforts that are going on in the industry, um, but let's kick it off. You know, how, how do we start sharing knowledge without sharing knowledge and, um, you know, comparing bits without kind of giving away the farm? So uh, Chaitanya, that was kind of, uh, you mentioned Baker bits there. So maybe you want to start off and then you guys please, please go. Yeah, I think I, um, you know, I, I sympathize with the question, but not at the comment at the end, like the benchmark product is not always a baker bit. I, I like to believe that the benchmark product is always the baker bit, <laughs> but it, it's a very interesting, I mean, it's a very important question, right? So, and, and Paul hit on uh, a, a key, uh, key area here, right? The drill bit providers go through nth degree, whether it's us, you know, or Andrew or whoever it might be, go through a lot of, um, you know, effort to design and, and develop certain products and certain features that I, I personally think that they themselves understand and they understand the best, right? So if you can, if you can make a, a, a sort of um, an interface where you have you know, the bit vendors providing their side of the modeling. And of course, that would mean that every uh, vendor will have to have a standardized, you know, capabilities in terms of modeling. That is certainly possible. Uh, and, and it's also, you know, the innovation, we, we're thinking always that the innovation is going to happen within the, uh, the verticals of bit vendor, motor vendor, et cetera. And I think the way to sort of think about it is that the innovation is probably you know, more so going to happen at the interfaces between all of those and, 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 and less so within them, right? I mean, there is a certain amount of innovation expected within each of these pillars, but I think key there is how do we, is to really figure out the interfaces. Yeah, and, and to add to that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of efforts, I guess, in the open sourcing from, from Paul and, and Chaitanya, you made a comment about the de democratization of the data. And there is also something in there, monetization of this thing. I think that is a little contrary. You know, it's I don't know if you intended it to be, a, you know, a prodding prodding comment there, but but I think it, a lot of operators probably would disagree with uh, with paying for some of that information. And uh, you know, so you know, third party vendors, as as you again highlighted, third party vendors with you know the the, the cutter analysis uh, softwares and and things like that really will need to, like you said, the interfaces of where the third party vendors are doing, you know, these analytical tools of the bit and the cutters and, you know, where the cutter vendors interface with that, where the bit vendors interface with that, <clears throat> uh, all of those things, you know, how do we evaluate all these different products and cutters? Uh, again, it's going to take a volume of data in some, you know, very baseline fundamental uh, commonality. And that just doesn't exist right now because these are all every, you know, from, from Baker Hughes to, to Smith bits and everybody's got their, um, you know, solutions that are specific to their bit types, to their, you know, cutter geometries and things like that. So uh, it really is going to take a bigger effort. And, uh, but again, the monetization, if you're making it so common, it, it becomes very challenging. I think the monetization comment is interesting and it's a, it's a good one because 
you know, I know, I know everybody argues about whose data it is, right? But if there was even a dollar placed on data quality and getting this data and, and it not being, uh, you know, Paul, I think you mentioned in a, in a call yesterday, it's like weeks before you can pull some of this data and get it from the service providers. And then it comes over in like an eight gig email, um, you know, certainly, certainly something around that where a rising tide would rise a lot of boats and um, contribute contribute positively to that. So, so Allison, I, I've been on every side of this equation, right? I've been on the services side, now I'm on the data side, I've been on the operator side. And I don't think my perspective has, my, my perspective of the concerns of each actor has changed, but my perspective of the actual value of what we're doing has never changed. And at the end of the day, I think we can all recognize that there's certain data that is like intrinsically of value to each to each actor, right? For the operator, there's some value, there's some data that like if they alone have it, gives them an information advantage that gives them value in the marketplace. And primarily that is around geosciences. Because once you've secured a right to to a mineral resource, you alone can can drill for and, and produce that resource, right? You have a monopoly on it. So from the operator perspective, we always made the statement that, you know, things like drilling data and bit forensics and things that are common to, to operation have almost no value if I keep them solely to myself. So some would argue that, well, if I can be better than my competition, I can put them out of business and go and buy their assets. And that's a really long play that's got a lot of risk to it. You better hope you're right. Um, but really, the, the value in, in all of this data that they collect because they have that monopoly on access to the resource is to share it as widely as possible to make an ocean of data and analytics that allows every boat to rise together. And I think other industries know this quite well, that it is in their best interest for all of their vendors to be as good as possible. And, and for that reason, they share things uh, among uh, their vendors and their partners a lot better than we do here in oil and gas. And so, the, the, that's an argument that I've made for probably the better part of a decade. And I'll say that I sat down with Paul Pestusek at ExxonMobil five years ago and explained this to him. And he was very opposed to it. Uh, and it was the Exxon position that, that they were opposed to that. But you can see that, that that perspective has, I think, changed and is changing from the operator perspective. So you see Exxon now asking, can we all give our bit forensics data to a common repository and let everybody get good at this and better at this? Um, and, and, and so that is changing. I think we as suppliers, as vendors, as partners need to understand what that means to our business and if possible, be as open and friendly to that as possible um, so, that, so that they can do that and we can all get better together. And then it goes back to what our business models are and what are we really competing with each other against, right? I think we're competing with each other against, uh, competing against each other on, on service levels and on the ability to influence outcomes, right? So to give our customers timely information that they can make decisions against. So those are, those are my thoughts around that. I'd be glad to, to hear others and just chat about it. One thing that I wanted to add was that I think, you know, data, you know, people compare data to the, I mean, I, I think you've, you've all read the articles like, hey, data is the new oil and everything. And, and I, I don't know if I, everybody has kind of wondered that and said, how many of you guys have actually bought oil, right? No one. I mean, people buy products, people buy uh, results out of the oil, people buy services out of the oil, people buy gas, which is a result of, you know, nth level, you know, sort of uh, changes it's gone through. So data itself, like you said, intrinsically, it isn't valuable unless it is in the hands of, or that insight that it generates is in the hands of people can actually do something, right? So you might generate all kinds of drill bit insights. Um, and if it's not either with, with the, the drilling provider, if it's not with Andrew or it's not with me, it sort of is meaningless because that's just an insight that's sitting out there. That's just data that's sitting out there. You have to translate that 
to a new bit design or do you have to translate that to an improvement in the product or service or something, right? And that's what's, I mean, when I say monetizable, now that is what people are willing to pay for. And it's it's true of any industry. You can go out there and, you know, even the IT industry or, or, or you know, any sort of digital industry out there, we never sign up for subscription services where we get a CSV file. I mean, how many of you guys have subscription services where you get a CSV file? I mean, you might get to one in a while, but that's not fairly common. You you get into subscription services, whether there is some rich content, your Netflixes of the world, or it provides useful services like, like getting your lunch at your home or getting your taxi, right? I mean, there's action that needs to happen. And, and, and really, the, the key there is to tie this data and analysis to the people who can act. And, and that's what I sort of mean by, you know, it's being available to everybody. Yes, you know, that's a, that's a novel idea at least. I mean, the counter argument that I would propose is that it absolutely needs to be available for people who can act. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Paul or uh, Jim, I think Paul has his hand raised. And I don't know how to let him speak. <laughs> I don't know if we should actually do that. What do you think, Paul? Actually, I've got there he is. There's the mug. Talking shot. permit. <laughs> The, the smiling face has emerged. You're on call. All gonna... right, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jim, my buddy pal. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's an interesting point, uh, Nathan, you brought up about kind of the changing attitudes. Uh, within Exxon, there's, you know, there's about 100,000 people and there's probably at least 100,000 plus one different opinions about data. And, and there are people that say, oh, no, all data is very valuable and we must keep it all to ourselves. And, and that is evolving. I think if, in fact, I've gone to work with other companies and some are still in the, I must hold it all to myself. Others are give it away. I'll give away everything as long as you help me get where I want to go. Um, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I, uh, my oldest son works out in California in the, in the, uh, in, you know, uh, internet startup business kind of thing. And I was talking to him about patents and he said, these guys, they don't bother with patents. He said, it takes two years to get a patent. And if you're six months behind the development cycle, you're out of the business. So, you know, by the time you were to ever get a patent and that's not exactly true because there, you know, there have been a few design patents and things on iPhones or whatever, but as a rule, they just say, move fast and move on. And, and I think we, in the oil field, you know, we've had patents that were 20 years old and they expired and people go, I'm finally glad that's over. Now I can do whatever X. You're going, oh my gosh, 20 years behind somebody else. So we're moving a lot faster. I think people are gonna recognize if you're gonna move fast, that means let other people help you get there. And that means share data. And that means, you know, leverage all of the available expertise in the industry. Don't try to do it all yourself. So. And, and people are, at least my opinion, people are seeing that a lot more, so. And, and Paul, I, I, I didn't even know you were on the call, so thank you for uh, responding. And, and, and I just wanna give you a personal shout out for that because we have seen the change in the mindset there and that recognition that um, we're all in this together and, and there is that opportunity to, to, to collaborate and share and, and kind of looking at the, the Silicon Valley model, it applies in some ways and it doesn't apply probably in more ways than it does apply to be perfectly honest, but to be able and willing to, to admit that to ourselves and to change our approach to business. And so I just, I really respect that, uh, that Exxon's moving that way. Yeah. yeah. So we've got, uh, I guess a question from Jim, which is a good one, uh, kind of getting down to a little bit of the brass tacks of, with all the advances in performance, especially over the last four years, so how much opportunity is still on the table? How much faster can we drill? So uh, you could also reword that and how much more is there to be able to learn? If it, if it takes a decade to pull three levers and learn from them, you know, how do you, 
how do you pull more levers and pull them more quickly so that you can accelerate and increase that that learning curve? Those are kind of two different questions, but but related, I think. So, so if I were to jump in and, and start with that, I would say, and, and I think others on the call could recognize this, if you were to double your drilling speed on most operations, you would not get the benefit that you think. Because we, you know, and I'll say, a large portion of that is due to bit design advancements. And so the bit industry needs to give itself a pat on the back. I think they've probably seen the biggest improvement in, in their service to, to the industry of, of perhaps anyone. Um, but if I'm looking at, at this from like a Dr. Deming perspective, from a process perspective, right? To me, it's stop trying to go faster and stop start trying to do everything the same every time and root out variance and root out waste at every possible opportunity. And, and I think honestly, if you did that, you'd probably end up saving yourself a lot more time than trying to go fast. I, I'm gonna argue, I'm, I wanna do both, thank you very much. I, uh, we, we recognize, I, for, first of all, by the way, fast, at the sacrifice of multiple bit runs is not worth it. If I can, almost 99% of the time, a single bit run, a single BHA run, I should say, actually, because the bit BHA, the motor all have to survive. Not having to make a trip uh, in an offshore rig, a, a trip may be $5 million. So, uh, you know, if you, if you add that time up and you go, okay, make it in a single run at 10% slower ROP, I'll take it only until I can speed the ROP back up to where it was, right? I mean, so, so that doesn't mean I don't want both. That's, all, that, that's the only point that I'll make is, is that in many cases, the trade-off, is, it's a false trade-off. Somebody says, I want to drill slower so I can get better borehole quality. And that's just not, there's no physics that tells me that that's true at all. Um, so, uh, you know, things like that, but not, not overloading the bit to the structural limit or not, uh, um, you know, chunking a motor, you know, running it beyond its limits. Yeah, I got to stay within the physics of, of what it can handle. So, yeah, I mean, go, go ahead. Drilling, drilling as a system, right? Uh, you know, the bit may not be the ROP limitation. I mean, Paul was you know, almost the king of saying, you know, drilling to the technical limit, right? So, uh, you know, to that point, is the bit is the bit the limiter? Uh, is the you know, mud system and carrying capacity the limiter? Right, there's a lot of different components. You know, again, that Paul mentioned it. You know, motor lives, NWD life. Uh, I mean, where so they, to really get back to the question, what's how far are we from the total optimization? You know, there's a lot of things. Uh, Chaitanya mentioned earlier that what basically what gets measured gets worked on. Uh, things like you know, mud carrying capacity, how do we get better at measuring kind of everything in general, uh, in, in addition to the bit, of course, uh, you know, taking the MWD in context, taking the different measurements of the rig in context, the bit dynamics in context, the, the lithology in context, um, everything kind of in context will push that limit up. And I mean, I, don't, I think we're in the very nascent phase, phase of understanding that whole drilling system because it's extremely complex and extremely uh, you know, dynamic from you know, formation pressures that give kicks. And, you know, there's a lot of different results that can happen and pressure sensors at the bit or pressure sensors in the, in the, uh, the BHA can help understand those components. So from a digitization, from, you know, kind of bring it back to this topic of digitization and how, how does it impact from drill bits and the drilling perspective and drilling performance, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of other components that make this model very complex. And I think we're just in the very, very, very beginning stages of putting all of those, uh, I'll call them like micro solutions almost together uh, in a way that's industry uh, can, can interpret it and action it, right? Yeah, good, good, good points, Andrew. I mean, a couple of things that I wanted to add was that um, we actually did an exercise where we, we took an operator's, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 well data and and looked at, I mean, you talked about Nathan consistency across you know wells, but we looked at consistency about across drilling the same you know certain sections of formation at the at this in a certain ROP, right? 
And when we start aggregating the best uh, performance across the same sort of section, across the same formation, you know, across all 20, 30 wells, and you built up this, you know, sort of uh, the best of the best, but in a, in a very micro scale, like every 10, you know, five feet or 20 feet, you see that we can gain tremendous, I mean, 20, 30% um, you know, enhancement in drilling just by being consistent, right? Just by doing what we did in the best case scenarios across all of those 20, 30 wells, just by doing that again and again and again, right? So there is potential out there. Now, philosophically speaking, there is a philosophical side of it as well. And, and you know, perhaps Paul um, can back me up on this. The tremendous gains in ROP that we, we, we have done have come at the expense of increased power delivery, right? I mean, I think really what we've done is that sort of eliminate, I mean, drill bits have done a great job of eliminating, uh, you know, bit failures, right? I mean, it used to be pretty bad. I mean, we used to only drill 200, 300 in fairly some of these challenging applications, uh, East Texas, you know, Travis Peak, et cetera. Now we're just drilling uh, the entire thing, right? You know that's added a lot of uh, you know you know potential and added a lot of value, but also there has been a tremendous growth in the amount of power delivered at the bit through these motors, through increased use of drill pipes, and you know uh, better BHAs, etc. And our our ROP gain has you know significantly been mostly on the power. I think there is a certain amount of uh, uh, efficiency that we can root out of the drilling process itself, the cutting process. Because if you look at you know the rock strength and look at how fast we're drilling, there is a lot of scope to be had, right? There is a lot of scope to be had in terms of you know drilling some of these rocks at an extremely fast pace, right? So by balancing the power delivery, enhancing uh, you know sort of efficiency, there is there is room to go. However, I don't think that, like I said, I kind of echo what I said before, is that I don't think we'll, we'll get there just by acting within the pillars of each of these products, whether it's bits, motors, et cetera, we'll get there together by, by combining or by having proper interfaces between all of those. Yeah, I, I want to reinforce some of what you said, and then I want to add to it a little bit too. Um, and, and I'll do it, if you will, just to tell a story in Guyana right now, and, and this is not every rig we've got down there. There's like six rigs down there, but 17 and a half inch hole section, we drill at rig limit ROP because of cuttings handling. That's how big the surface handling equipment is. It's not bit limited. And we TD every time, 100% of the time. So uh, in 12 and a quarter, about 80 to 90% of the footage is rig limit, is not rig limited, but it's limited ROP because of ECD, where, where fracture breakdown pressure on the, on the formation, kind of a physics-based limit. Uh, and then in the eight and a half, we're control drilling because of data rates uh, for MWD data rates. Now, it, it, by the way, we got a lot to do on 12 and a quarter inch drill bits because I still have that 20% of the footage, which represents about 30 to 50% of the time. So, man, I need to get that all control drilled as well, right? The other is, by the way, I don't quit fussing. I go fuss at the uh, rig equipment guys and I say, hey, how can we add another shaker? What can we do to you know, handle more cuttings faster and all that? So it may not be a bit guy having the data. And oh, by the way, having a bit that doesn't whirl and doesn't go nuts on me when I'm control drilling is very valuable. So yes, the bit guys are still involved even in a situation when we are control drilling. Um, so you know, the, the all, all I say, and by the way, I fuss at the MWD guys when they can't give me data faster. Where's my, where's my 48 bits per second or whatever, you know, and it hasn't justified wired pipe yet, but you know, if we keep going, pushing that limit, maybe that's the next thing for us to do. So, um, Shatanya, you said uh, motor and power, good gracious. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the amount of power available today is um, unbelievable compared to what it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, I think that uh, uh, the one thing I will say, if I ran bits today, and I'm talking about operational parameters, if we as an industry ran the bits the way we did 15 years ago, and I'm talking about East Texas, we go to bottom slow at 180 RPM and just gently touch bottom, you know, so as not to hurt anything, whirling the whole time, we'd, we'd, we'd bust every cutter on a bit today, even the very best cutter. So, so a lot of that improvement in design has been has been also with improvements in operational practices. So, 
Um, anyway, I, all I say is uh, whoever, whoever asked, are we at the end of the line? No, my goodness, no. I, I, we, just, we just tripled the ROP in a section in Argentina. We've been drilling down there five years. So, you know, uh, if, you, if you said, oh, I can, uh, you know, I, I have nothing left to do. Nope, there was plenty left. And, and we haven't even, we, we, can see, we can see additional improvements. So, uh, and again, we just did a couple of one bit sections, uh, one, one BHA sections, not even, it was typically not the bit that failed, but the motors, cause it's hot hole. So, you know, those kinds of things. There's, oh gosh, uh, whoever thinks they've run out of things to do, let me know. I, I, <laughs> You'll put them to work, huh? I got a list of things. <laughs> so you mentioned the Argentina uh, example, you know, Nathan, Andrew, Chaitanya, I'd be interested to see, are there any particular geographical areas where you guys think that the most, where learning more, you know, kind of going back to the, the point of this, right? Learning more, better data, better software solutions, better infrastructure, where that could be, uh, you, could, you could make some significant gains. Are there particular countries or areas of drilling um, where there's a lot of low hanging fruit when it comes to, to advancement? Uh, I would say the fruit, the fruit that we really want to go after is probably the days, right? Um, your, your days versus depth curve is, is uh, king. It's going to drive your AFEs and drive the overall well cost. So reducing days, particularly on yeah, you know, operations that have high rig costs. Yeah, offshore was mentioned. Uh, that's always a big cost. If you have remote land operations, those are always, you know, always good to be able to, you know, go in and optimize. And, and apply your learnings there. I mean, you know, you need platforms. I think uh, Slumberjay came out with something, right? This Delphi platform, um, it kind of brings in all these things together uh, in, in an attempt to at least and, uh, and really try to put everything in context. So, so to the question is, is there an area that's more beneficial? I would almost say, okay, well, I mean, show me the highest day rate and there's your biggest opportunity. And, and I would say, you know, Paul's experience that he just shared in Argentina probably highlights one of, you know, I'm not going to say it's an area, a, a geographic area, but it's really where you find that you have the weakest um, organizational structures. So, you know, they can go and triple ROP in a section in Argentina because they brought an organizational structure to bear against it that could uh, approach drilling as, as the full system it was like you were saying earlier uh, on the call here, it could say, let's address our whole cleaning. Let's address, let's address our pit design. Uh, really let's address our supply chain, right? When we talk to, when we talk to like the geothermal guys, right? They have really, really long um, times to deliver these wells. And it's not because the technology is the limiter, not because the process is the limiter, but, but for them, they just don't have supply chains in place that can keep them from waiting on parts and materials all the time um, so i'd say you know organizationally it, it doesn't matter if you have the best technology and the best tools if you're missing that right and so once you have a play you know and, and generally find that that's an area right that's where it's hard to get people in and out of it's hard to get communications in and out it's hard to get supplies in and out of and so that tends to be where the organization breaks down so um, that that's where i would start if you were if i was you know king of the drilling world and then I would say, okay, let's bring an organization to bear and just make sure that we have appropriate practices, appropriate tools and appropriate supplies. Well, one thing to add to, to, to the conversation, Allison, is that, um, you know, anywhere, I mean, it could be, there is, I mean, I would say the opportunity is there pretty much all across the world, right? I mean, and, and the reason why is that uh, the, if you look at the inefficiency of a certain area of drilling, it's super high when you start, right? Because you're exploring, you don't know what's going on. You're just taking a wild guess of how we need to really, you know, drill and produce and you are improving, right? So the, the inefficiency goes down tremendously as you go and that's really the process. So there might be some areas of the world that, that don't follow the process or they don't have a robust structure to follow the process where the inefficiency lingers on longer, but it sort of tapers off, right? When you when you keep drilling, you drill like hundred wells and so on. 
but after that what I, what we tend to notice is that you know people tend to change crews tend to move out rigs tend to move out or there is a downturn you lose all of that knowledge and, and we don't do a good job of preserving that knowledge so when when the new people going we almost go through that uh, that you know sort of amnesia and we we recover that you know learning again so the inefficiency temporarily grows up and we we relearn what we have to relearn and then we goes down tripping right so in, in this sort of up and down cycles that it as it continues the the uh, the organizations or areas of the world um, where we have uh, you know robust structures or you know you know teams like Pauls where they're, they're already keeping in track and they're trying to take good practices from one area of the world and the other uh, you know make faster progress but various that as well that are very regimented where you're tendering a lot of product or where you're where you're it, it's it, there is a three-year contract right and and you're only allowed to provide a certain type of product right things tend to be a little bit challenging to operate uh, but I you know I think things are changing even in those environments as well yeah that's that business continuity that's so important I have I have this some you you had a cartoon up and I have one in my head where you know the whole industry is kind of staring down the the well bore you know wondering how we can can get faster and and meanwhile you know there's just money flying out the window just in terms of how efficiently we run our businesses just basic blocking and tackling of business continuity where we try to retain information within the business um, or at least maybe a little bit better so that those, those knowledge, that knowledge and those efficiencies are translated, you know, when you do make change outs and things like that. Um, I, I've got a, a, a sister-in-law who just started in the insurance world and she, she's been there a week and I was speaking with her earlier this morning and she said, oh yeah, this person was called on, you know, this date, this date, this date, here are the notes. I mean, they, they, so you they're like, wow, you, you know all of this and you have access to this and you can look up all this history about a particular account or a particular opportunity. And, you know, and she's a weekend. There's no tribal knowledge there, um, or at least it's attempted to be minimized. So, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, another challenge that people seem to be looking towards. Um, so we've got about uh, six minutes. And the one thing that you brought up, and I was kind of excited to talk about because it's not something that I hear about much, uh, Chaitanya, was this whole idea of sustainability, reducing carbon footprint, you know, how does the oil industry go green and still kind of be the oil and gas industry? Um, so would, would you guys mind commenting on that? And Andrew, we'd love to hear from you on, on any of Schlumberger's kind of approaches to that as well. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it, you know, Ch Chaitanya really had, had said it, you know, from a materials and consumption standpoint uh, and, and, you know, waste production, that's really the, the, the main focus is right of, of Schlumberger is just the okay. sheer volume of work that we do and consumables that we consume is, is pretty high. So uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's the majority of it. I mean, I don't know how much more I, I need, I, I'm gonna elaborate, but um, I'll, I'll hand it to Chaitanya since he brought it up. So, so I mean, for, for us, he, he, you know, it was as as much as a, as a shock to the to the employees as it was sort of to the um, oil field industry and such that when Baker Hughes about three or four years ago I think it was uh, you know went up there and our CEO said hey we're going to be you know net zero by 2050 and you know we're going to cut our you know carbon footprint in half by 2030 and you know that sort of sent shock waves um, for us internally. Uh, because, you know, it, it completely changes the perspective, right? I mean, it changes like, you know, drill bits, um, especially tungsten carbide, diamond, you know, these are very, very, very energy uh, dense products. And uh, I know it's, we still yet to see on the, on the overall adoption. And then, you know, it would be nice to hear actually Paul's comments on, on how Exxon's thinking here, but we are certainly, beginning to, to be approached by some, especially international, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, customers who are beginning to ask these questions like, hey, you know, how much carbon footprint is there in your tools? Like, you know, what is your strategy of reducing carbon footprint? Especially some of your our, our European clients are, are questioning those, right? And that sets up a very, very um, interesting conversation for us. Uh, it, it certainly sets up uh, an interesting way of to, to think about the problem. Uh, certainly from a big picture, I would, I would still think that, you know, trying to understand the efficiencies of the process and, you know, energy density is, is going to be a very uh, challenging transformation if it all actually takes scale within, within, uh, within our industry. And particularly from the data side, Alison and Nathan, I mean, I guess there is literally, I mean, this is ripe for opportunity because there is nothing. I mean, nobody captures anything today. And it's, it's even to come up with the question of carbon footprint for a drill bit, it's a very, very hard question to answer, right? So this area is ripe for opportunity for, for, uh, for people like you to come in and provide solutions that, that really help us answer some of the questions that, that are being asked. Yeah, we're... We're, we're trying to get people on the you know rig site to not 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 physically print out paper reports and then to walk them 90 you know 36 feet and then set them where then those reports are you know kind of entered into another system right let's 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 you know reduce a carbon footprint there I guess one sheet of paper at a time that it sounds it sounds like nothing but it, it probably probably adds up um nathan uh and paul uh, you paul you joined our panelists welcome our surprise <laughs> panelists paul pastusik <laughs> um, nathan or paul any any comments on sort of this uh this uh you know oil and gas industry going green reducing carbon footprints uh maybe even from the perspective of how we work and leverage software and technology to do things like this we would have had a pretty significant carbon footprint uh, if we would have all gotten in a room together today. Um, so look at us doing our part. Uh, but please, we've got just a couple of more minutes. So we'd love to hear some final comments from you. Let me, let me see if I can do this in 60 seconds. Uh -oh. Not in any way supplant anything that ExxonMobil has officially said in any legal documents or forecast or anything else we say. This is Paul's personal view uh, and maybe with some insight. but. Number one, uh, we do believe, Exxon believes that we do not have the right to exist. We get a license to operate from the, from the host governments where we work, and that includes the United States. So we have to be good citizens to those effect. So yes, if those citizens say, hey, carbon is really important to us, then we better respond. And this industry, I think, better respond. Uh, Exxon has publicly said, hey, we continue to believe that energy uh, and the oil and gas ind energy has a significant place forward for the foreseeable future. And I don't know what that is, 20 years, 30 years, that you can't just switch as fast as people might like to do. So I, I think that's number one, but I think number two, um, we do recognize that yes, we should be greener. And that's not just, inter not, you know, that's not just reducing paper, but, but flaring. You could, have you, anybody I still see them. What the heck are we doing? That's good stuff. We're burning. That's energy, man. Forget about the CO2. You're just, you're just like burning money. So I, I think we need to, and I know why we do it because it costs money to hook up a, uh, a pipeline and I don't have that pipeline hooked up yet. So, and I want the oil out of the ground today because I got to pay my bills. We could be, we could be using that to power, you know, computer Computers and servers to mine Bitcoin or something. <laughs> now you're, oh yeah. man, no, wait, don't get me started on what Bitcoin costs in any. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if you're holding Doge, yeah, if we could mine Doge. Oh. With yeah, there we go. So anyway, I all I say is yes, uh, this industry uh, had best uh, adapt very fast. It is, and, and you. That's uh, that's a worldwide phenomenon. That's not just uh, you know just the U.S. by any means. In fact, actually, it's probably stronger in the Europe and uh, than it has ever been in the U.S. So, anyway. Yep. 
and, and, and I'll chime in again and, and I'll take the position Paul took that I'm, I'm speaking more for myself than for Teradata because they have, they have carved out positions, but we have to carve out positions that are friendly to the industries we serve who may not have the same positions as oil and gas on this. And, um, but, but personally, you know, I, I recognize like, you know, we, we're, we don't build things at Teradata. We do digital things. So, so we have to help the people that do build things and we can't come in and like, promise to change the laws of physics. And I think there's some people who think we can't, right? And, and, and we're not among them, right? No matter what you do, it takes a certain amount of energy to heat a drill bit up to a thousand degrees so you can braise it and, and build the thing so that it's competent so it can cut rock, right? We're, we, we can't, there's only a certain amount of energy we can remove from that process before, we, before we're chasing you know, good, good results with tons of money that we'll never get back. Um, but what we often find is that um, just simple exercises in supply chain and logistics optimization are, are some of the biggest opportunities that we have. Uh, we did a project with Maersk a few years ago where we just started tracking their, their refrigerated containers, right? So they could understand their efficiency in that shipping. And we found a couple of containers that had circumnavigated the globe seven times with the refrigeration on with no cargo. And so, you know, that's a, that's a decent chunk of carbon footprint that they could remove with, with very little cost and just a little bit of a better insight into where their things are going. I think the same thing could be said for, for the oil field. I think, you know, th there's definitely a lot of um, waste in supply chains. We think about probably just about every hot shot that's ever gone out is probably waste because it's, it represents something we failed to do in our supply chain that could have been in a place with a lower cost, lower carbon footprint uh, mode of transport, right? Um, but also looking at how we can uh, put technology at the edge instead of people. And I'll say, you know, as someone who worked in, in automation systems and controls design for a while, I'm, I'm not gonna argue that automation should replace all people. I think that the automotive industry and the aerospace industry have shown us that that is not wise fundamentally, but it can replace some and it can uh, repurpose others so that uh, we can minimize the just human transport, right? There's cost of pe putting people on the edge and often simple technologies that allow things to happen on the rig so that you don't have to take an object off the rig uh, to, to be inspected or to, to be, be taken from a place for temporary storage or something like that. Anytime that we can lean that out, we're, we're by definition reducing our carbon footprint, but that also has a direct dollar value on the bottom line. Uh, and so it's a, it's a win-win. So generally that is our approach is we wanna, we find that we're most able to help people with um, re reducing the headcount requirements uh, in, in edge locations and in leaning out supply chains and, and reducing logistics costs and footprints. So that, that's how we, how we look at it on our side. Which we might promptly toss out the window when oil goes to a hundred barrels, a uh, hundred bucks a barrel next year, right? Or no? <laughs> Line up the hot shots and get the bits to the Permian, everybody. <laughs> there you go. Well, I, one of the things to add to what Nathan just said there, you know, the, the cost of a drill bit is about the same, whether it's a really good drill bit. And I'm talking about an energy cost in manufacturing and in engineering design, whether it's a good one or a bad one. So a good one that lasts, you know, that I can repair and run five times is way more valuable and less carbon intensive than a bad one. So we, we can do a lot and we need to take credit for those sort of things. Look at how many bits that are repaired five times plus these days. And yes, it still takes the same amount of energy and the, the same raw materials to make the first one but not to run it a second, third, fourth time. So anyway. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It's about, uh, it's 11.35. So we've kind of gone just a little bit over. Um, any final comments or questions from the audience? All right, well, Chaitanya, Andrew, Nathan, uh, thank you all very much for for joining us today. Um, we will post this on the IADD YouTube channel. It'll be available probably another three or four days um, for you to share and like and uh, continue to comment on. 
But until then, you guys have a wonderful day. And thank you all again for joining us and for your time today. Cheers, everybody. Yep. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye.